Hi, everybody. This is Ron Moritz, connecting from Jerusalem. I'm the host and moderator for today's webinar on IoT security. And I want to thank everybody for taking some time to uh, join us today. Uh, some of you may know me. Uh, for the rest, I'm our crowd cybersecurity venture partner, which basically means that I have some expertise in this space of cybersecurity. And my fingers have actually touched um, every one of the cybersecurity investments that our crowd has made uh, on the platform since uh, the platform launched in 2013. Um, I've been involved in cybersecurity both as a practitioner uh, before it was a vogue and fashionable profession as it is today, and as a technology exec at both startups and global multinationals. Um, today's cybersecurity focus is going to be on this area of uh, cybersecurity challenges that we face both as individuals and as enterprises from the billions of devices that are already connected to the global internet and the billions more that we expect to see uh, that will become attached to that global internet in the coming years. Uh, to be clear, I'm not talking about smart mobile phones, uh, pads, laptops, servers, all the typical devices that have been uh, part of the internet uh, for many, many years, uh, and devices that have been protected from cybersecurity uh, challenges uh, using very sophisticated uh, solutions, um, some of which uh, are representative of the companies we've already invested in. Uh, those solutions were designed for powerful computers. What we're talking about here are actually the majority of the internet connected devices. Uh, and these are at the other end of the technology spectrum. They range from inexpensive gadgets and tools like cameras and doorbells that you may see in your home networks to single purpose medical devices connected to hospital networks uh, and even industrial robots connected to manufacturing networks. Uh, these are very different uh, both in their design and their purpose uh, than the uh, traditional devices that we know about that connect us to the internet. The result is a lot more challenges that we face when we put these devices on the internet. First, there's no security infrastructure in place designed to respond to the security challenges that such devices um, introduce. Uh, second, the devices themselves actually lack the capacity to support existing security solutions. So we can't simply take the existing security layers that we have and, and expect them to work uh, with these types of uh, devices. And third, uh, and this is really an important point, uh, the manufacturers of the devices themselves have very few incentives to prioritize and build security features into the products. Uh, the result is that we've been seeing an increased number of hacks uh, into data privacy and security in general. Uh, one of those uh, examples that we often talk about uh, because it did reach um, kind of the everyman newspaper was the Mirai botnet attack of 2016. And it really showed the security weaknesses of interconnected uh, devices, specifically uh, video cameras uh, that were exploited. Um, and a number of cameras that were actually uh, compromised uh, were actually leveraged to attack servers in the United States uh, servers which could no, which were then overloaded and could no longer deliver services to legitimate users. Um, we'll dive further into this case uh, a little bit later in the webinar, uh, and we'll see how uh, technology from Nanolock uh, is actually uh, uniquely positioned to help organizations deal with such challenges. Uh, before I introduce the panel, I want to encourage you to send all your questions uh, to us through the webinar panel on your screen. Uh, we'll run a Q&A at the end of the panel uh, and try to get to as many of those questions uh, as possible. Uh, so with that, let me introduce uh, our three speakers. Um, Greg Rossman is a board member at Netgear. Uh, Netgear, of course, is a, a global networking company that has a tremendous number of uh, very innovative uh, products, um, often delivered to consumers as well as businesses and service providers. Uh, and I can share that I've been a long time Netgear user, so I'm glad uh, Greg could join us today. Uh, Amit Gatani is a senior director with Micron, not necessarily the same brand name recognition as uh, we have with Netgear, but for those of us uh, with tech hats on, uh, we know Micron as an industry leader in an area of very innovative memory and storage solutions. So uh, very happy to have 
uh, Amit join us as well. Uh, and finally, um, we have Iran Fine, who I met uh, a number of months ago uh, when we were first introduced to Nanolock. He is the CEO and co-founder of Nanolock, uh, and he's found a very elegant way to eliminate the risks that the devices that we just talked about uh, have uh, introduced uh, onto the internet when they become connected. To, uh, everybody to submit your questions uh, through the online uh, panel in the um, webinar. I want to turn to uh, Amit. Again, as a reminder, Amit is with um, Micron. Uh, as uh, Ron mentioned, Micron is a, um, a very uh, significant um, company uh, in the memory space. Um, hopefully, as everybody understands, uh, memory is an integral part of uh, any type of computing or technology device. Um, there is no technology without memory. Um, you know, obviously, uh, the processor is an important component as well, uh, but memory is everywhere. And one of the um, motivations I think that uh, you know, uh, we've seen in, in Nanolock's focus on the memory uh, is that um, you know, memory is where everything happens. It's where your program code is stored. So, Amit, I'd actually like to hear from you. Um, you know, I've heard it from uh, from uh, Iran in the past, but uh, fr from you directly as to how you at Micron or you as a memory uh, developer, um, you know, see the problems uh, of security in these devices that are getting connected to the uh, internet. Um, you know, what's your perspective on all that? Sure. Thanks, Ron. Um, uh, hopefully, everybody uh, you know knows Micron. Um, like Ron mentioned earlier, maybe our brand name isn't as big as Netgear, but we make up uh, for that in our revenue and uh, market cap. So I'm good with that. Um, the you know from a memory provider's perspective, you know we have been aware of these type of problems for quite some time, right? Uh, the, the problem that Iran uh, pointed out to, um, you know, we as a memory provider, we have known that these vulnerabilities have existed in the system for a very long time. And in the past, you know, let's roll back, right? The, the, the world was somewhat of a kind of a, a not connected world where your memory was programmed once in the manufacturing and then most of the time you didn't need to update that memory, right? So there was no provision for in the field update for the memory. You pretty much kind of lived in an era where your security was by obscurity that nobody kind of knew how to deal with memory and people didn't get to that, right? <clears throat> Those days are well gone. now. In the IoT connected world, everything is connected by design and by definition. You have to create pathways in the system for memory to be updated in the field through over the air updates that Iran talked about, right? So every device that you, every IoT device that you have fundamentally has a mechanism um, uh, to now do an over the air update or in, in one form or the other. So obscurity doesn't work anymore um, you have uh, created pathways in the system for people to access memory in the in, for the for the right reasons um, but that also creates uh, creates the opportunity for people to get in and do other things or do you know um, uh, attacks that previously were not that interesting right now the attacks become a lot more interesting because these IOT devices you can you can modify them for various purposes, reasons. You know, you we talked about the Mirai botnet uh, 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 attack earlier, right? So now uh, it doesn't work, and you have to really focus on how do you protect what is in the memory, which is the really truly the the heart of a device, which is the code with which the device runs. Um, what is the type of protection, and how do you need to make sure that you don't have you you can establish trust in the device and trust in the code that is running. And that's kind of the foundational gap that has existed in the past, right? Previously, if you think about the, the memory didn't have much of a protection itself, the protection uh, part of the, the protection uh, was perhaps provided by the, the processor. As we worked with our customers uh, for quite some time, um, our customers continuously tell us that 
the protection that is in the processes is highly fragmented, very difficult to use, very different from one processor generation to the other. And hence, you know, significant part of those features, even if they existed, they could not be leveraged and used in the system and are dormant in the system. So, you know, looking at this situation back in around 2015, Micron decided that we, this is the time that Micron needs to address this part of the market with his specific, uh, his specific product line. And we call our product line uh, and technology uh, Authenta. And what it does is it builds these uh, um, capabilities and primitives um, in the flash memory itself that the, our customers can utilize and our partners like Nanolock can utilize to, uh, to do cloud-based uh, security management. So maybe let me pause here and see if I can, uh, uh, Ron, if uh, that makes sense or address another thing that you're thinking about. Right. I hope we didn't go too technical. And, and again, I uh, will encourage people to ask questions if there was something that wasn't clear or you know, if you need more um, uh, information uh, about anything that we talk about, uh, please do ask those questions. Uh, but it seems like um, one of the things that may have led you to um, besides a long time relationship with Iran, but uh, you know, that led you to actually consider or look at uh, Nanolock uh, was that you couldn't find um, good solutions uh, either, uh, and this is not meant to be offensive against the team at Micron, but either from any kind of internal developed ideas or from alternative solutions in the market. So maybe we can, Maybe you can elaborate a little bit further about what you thought might have been missing or what you know at this point was missing when you were looking for solutions uh, in the marketplace uh, to solve some of the challenges that you just talked about in terms of, you know, how do you protect the code that's put into these uh, flash memory uh, units that get put into the various devices uh, that are then connected to the internet? Yeah, so maybe <clears throat> let me clarify that, right? So. You know, Nanolock is a partner for us, right? We are complementary in the ecosystem and together address the problem that the industry is facing, right? You know, Micron's Authenta technology creates the, the secure capabilities in the flash that a partner like Nanolock can now leverage from the cloud and uh, their management console to, uh, to deliver to end customers you know, like Netgear, Taltanka, or anybody else uh, that Iran was pointing to, right? A solution that is from silicon to cloud, right? So Micron's Authenta, we were marching down the path of developing these capabilities, but we knew and we our game plan has always been to enable these capabilities to our partners like Nanolock so that they can provide, we can have an end-to-end -end solution available to our customers, right? At the end of the day, customers are looking for, um, you know, establishing trust in the system, having kind of uh, being able to uh, have a trust in the identity, trust in the code uh, that is running our code integrity, and trust in the data, which may be in the flash, right? So code integrity and data integrity, these are the type of things that our customers are looking for. And how do we enable that, right? How do we enable that um, not at, a, at just a capability level, but at solution level? And that's where Nanolock comes in, right? Nanolock very well understood as we started to work with Nanolock a couple of years back, um, we saw that Nanolock clearly understood that, you know, addressing security as a security, because that's a cost mindset in this uh, for customers is not the right way. How do we turn security into value add for customers? And what are the customers trying to do is manage these massive deployment of IoT devices, keeping them updated, making them there secure. And that's the vision that we saw that Nanolock understood really well and really aligned very well with Micron's vision of how we want to roll out security for these devices. So, um, if I if I may jump in for a second, Ron. Yes. Um, and 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 the, the, what Amir just said, which I, I fully agree with. Micron customers are device makers, the OEM. None of our customers are enterprises, utilities, and so on and so forth. What works perfectly with 
with Mike on and with the mate, who's, as I said, is, is we got it from this first second we started speaking, is that we're actually fully aligned. Because when we speak with, for example, the utility, he wants to deploy the end result, the end product in the smart meter, Micron's customer. When we speak with a smart city or a system integrator, it says, okay, I want it in my cameras. Perfect. That's a Micron solution. If we're speaking with a device maker, a, a router, um, um, the Japanese company, Tiltonica, so on and so forth, that's a Micron customer. So the, the, the end user uses the NanoLock service and security feature set by deploying a micro a Micron product. So if we are successful, and Amit and I are working very, very hard to become successful, is when Micron sells more memories which are secure than NanoLock enabled, and we can come to the customer and say, by using Micron, now we have a feature set that we have had never seen before, uh, both in terms of security and learning and so on and so forth. So I think that's the fundamental nature and what Micron had done with Authenta is eased significantly the ability to work with them. And what we had done and doing actually with Micron is bringing them, I think, some insights from security and end customers' perspective. So they even tweak a little bit the Authenta to be more end customer compatible. Um, and I think there's a perfect um, collaboration with the Micron. Let me let me actually try to uh, walk through something that's been you know, spinning in my head because I just happened to watch one of the Mission Impossible movies the other day. So, if if an organization, uh, an enterprise, decides to put up a bunch of cameras uh, that then they connect to the internet so that they could be monitored and the feeds can be uh, you know, delivered to a control room. Um, then the concern, obviously, having seen the movies, uh, is that somebody is able to somehow compromise that camera uh, and you know interrupt that video stream. Uh, so what I think I've heard you uh, and me talk about uh, is that because you know if that camera now has uh, some micron technology um, embedded inside. Uh, that is designed to support the NanoLock solution, then the NanoLock solution can be used by the enterprise to be able to ensure that any of the program code in the Micron flash memory, uh, that the program code that you know typically would be altered by an attacker, right, to change the video stream, um, that program code could no longer be modified because the enterprise using that camera was now able to be the only organization that can make any changes to the code in the camera, to the flash, uh, the code stored in the flash memory of that camera. Did, did I kind of lay that out correctly? Is that the uh, scenario? You laid it out perfectly. Yeah. And, and just to make it, um, just to bring uh, Greg and, and, and the way that he presents, uh, his, the industry that he uh, uh, represents, so this could be an attack on the cameras, this can be an attack on the communication devices inside. Um, from any, the enterprise perspective, he wants his devices to be protected from either it's a mission impassable kind of scenario or other scenarios. Um, so yes, that's exactly this. And you may find Micron in the router, you may find it in the cameras. Um, and this is exactly where Micron and, and Nanolock are fully aligned. Right, right. Yeah, so actually, Ron actually, laid it out. You, you you laid it out really well, right? And um, maybe let me just kind of add, you know, one more uh, layer to it, right? At this point and era, we, you know, the devices are not generally something that we are we have a human interface to, right? So yeah, video camera maybe the control room is looking at. Really, the, the challenge is that the, you know, we are moving into the autonomous era where everything is kind of self-managed or, you know, you make decisions trusting the data that is coming from the device. And that's a very da dangerous space, right? So having the trust in the device and trust in the data that it, what it is sending is really correct is critical for a vision of this autonomously managed devices to, to exist, right? So the, the problem is, the, the problem is pretty uh, significant and, uh, you know, we are working on addressing addressing that part of the problem in a way that doesn't add cost to the solution, right? So 
flash memory, like uh, Iran said, is present in every device that you have. So what we have done is integrated these capabilities in the flash memory so that there's no cost adder, right, which is critical for these devices and made it extremely simple for the for the OEMs to use it and our partners like Nanolock to leverage uh, this to, to deliver the services. And those are the things that are critical for this, uh, this stuff to get rolled out. Thank you, Amit, for uh, enhancing, uh, enhancing that a bit. Uh, I want to jump over to Greg a little bit uh, because as we were talking about uh, kind of the you know, shifting from the, the actual flash memory to the devices that use them, uh, obviously Netgear represents uh, uh, that, that stage of manufacturing, right, of delivery of uh, products that uh, enterprises and consumers use. Um, and I want to understand, maybe Greg, could, you could offer some insights as to how Netgear uh, thinks about this problem of the, you know, the security challenges uh, that the various devices that, that, that uh, Netgear manufactures and sells in the market uh, could uh, you know, present if they're not properly uh, locked down and, and secured. Uh, so maybe you can give us some color on, on the security challenges as, as Netgear sees them. Sure. Thank you, Ron, and nice to meet everyone. Um, you know, at, a, at, a, at the highest of levels, we got to say from Netgear's perspective, we are thrilled that Micron and other semiconductor manufacturers and startups like Nanoloc are approaching this problem from the bottoms up uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, my, my area of, of investment has been networking and semiconductor over a long period of time, been on a variety of boards, and I started my career in the semiconductor industry as a chip designer. And it, what I find fascinating is that when we started bu building, when I started building silicon 30 years ago, um, as Amit said, it was so obscure and esoteric that nobody really ever bothered to talk about security risk getting inside unless we were working on some military projects and things like that. Now it has come completely front and center again, where, where if you have a chip background, you, you now realize that, wow, in order to really address these problems, you've got to start at the silicon. And I'm thrilled that companies are, are realizing that. Uh, I have been focused on that from an investment perspective in looking at security by design from the ground up. And now more and more companies are, are beginning to embrace that. Netgear was one of the first publicly traded companies to create a cyber security committee at the board level, just like an audit committee or a compensation committee or a nomination and governance committee. About four years ago, we created a cyber committee because it was clear to us that we were supplying product routers into a consumer environment and the, the d amount of, of crime, basically, that had been propagated throughout the world to steal credit card numbers, personal identities, photographs, times when you come and go from your house, et cetera, was only going to exponentially increase. And we had to uh, be not only aware of it from an inside perspective, from a corporate security perspective, but from a product security perspective as well. So this has been a huge motivation for us um, at, at Netgear, as well as some of the other networking companies uh, in the US. Uh, and as I said, we're thrilled with the efforts that, that Micron and others uh, are, are putting into the solutions. Specifically, uh, now, we are driven at Netgear by security by design. Uh, we all have legacy products in the marketplace. We've tried to do the best job we can at the time uh, and currently in, in, in retroactively trying to protect some of those devices. But it's also very clear to us that pro forma, the new products we make uh, are, are even more mission critical. Um, these days. So we take a, it's very, very important to us. And we spend a great deal of time and in internal and external energy into ensuring we work with vendors that can help us do that. Um, 
We do not design our own silicon at Netgear. Uh, if you look at companies like Cisco, who still spin their own uh, ASICs, if you look at companies like Apple, Apple, because of their proprietary environments, have been able to spin very sophisticated uh, silicon to enable their secure platform and, 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 and amplify its, its capabilities to be protected. So Netgear is constantly on the lookout for solutions that will enable the product, the router product uh, for sure, and all of our products for that matter, to be uh, hardened, uh, capable, and to be able to withstand attacks. Uh, so we've been pushing hard to do that. The Netgear router platform started out very simplistically 20 years ago, uh, 22 years ago, uh, and has gotten far more complex. CPU capability in the router, much, much higher. Memory capacity, much, much higher. Throughput capacity, much, much higher. Multiple channels of radio egress and ingress. Um, so the devices, without question, have become you know, far more complex. The bill of materials has gone up. Uh, and interestingly, if you look at the prices of these products, you know, you still still buy a very, very sophisticated Netgear router for, for $299 to $399. And, and we have to maintain those prices to stay in, in a competitive nature with our, with our customer base uh, globally. And at the same time, we have to provide better and better, more sophisticated security because our number one concern is, you know, we put a secure router in someone's house and they connect a camera or a doorbell or a garage door opener, opener that costs $20. And, and, and because it costs $20, you know, it, it, to, to, to buy, it costs $5 to make or less. And therefore, how much security can you build into a three or five dollar product? You connect that product to your network and all of a sudden you provide a gateway for a bad guy to get in uh, or bad girl. So we we are very conscious of this these days, spend a great deal of time, energy and money ensuring that the routers are uh, leading edge as best as can be commercially and economically supported. Um, certainly we could make a, a more secure router if we charge $10,000 for the router, but we also know that that's not possible. So we are working with a variety of companies to, to help us ensure that the product is as safe as possible for the economic points that we drive in the marketplace. Well, you know, to, your, to your last point on the economics, uh, I could argue that uh, even a $10,000 router from Cisco uh, reaches the market with a certain uh, level of security flaws uh, embedded inside. So uh, the fact that you're, you're focused on uh, security by design, that uh, rings true for me as a, as a longtime advocate of uh, that idea. Uh, nevertheless, uh, you brought up a different point that I think is worth um, maybe culling uh, through a bit further. Um, you talked about these lower end devices, uh, the devices that you referred to as being attached to Netgear um, equipment. Um, that's certainly a concern. Um, I, I, I'm wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about how um, a solution that is embedded in the, the flash memory, right, a security approach uh, based on the flash memory, the same flash memory ultimately that goes into both uh, inexpensive, uh, you know, sub $5 you know, manufacturing cost uh, devices uh, that, that, you know, would go into a um, more expensive and more robust product like a Netgear, you know, two or $300 uh, router. Um, it seems like having a uh, uh, platform such as uh, Nanolock, which is, is leveraging, um, you know, security that the uh, flash memory makers like Micron is, you know, embedding into their uh, product um, seems to be a, a great way to go for both ends of the market, both companies like Netgear on one end and then the companies manufacturing devices uh, that connect to Netgear on the other. Um, maybe you could share some thoughts on that. Well, so I'm a big fan in some ways of industry-wide standard solutions. Uh, standards, as you know well, have 
dramatically affected the price and performance of, of networking equipment over the last 25 years. Um, I see potentially a solution like Nanolock or something of that ilk if it were to become more standardized. We all know and that uh, from a networking perspective that if you have a, a capacity at each end of the network, a protocol, a, a, an engine, if you will, at each, at each point uh, of the, at the center or the, and at the, at, the, at the end point, if you had that capability, you can do more to protect and govern and, and manage devices. On the one hand, that's great. On the other hand, People hate the idea of having to have compatibility with with one with an endpoint to a central point. And over the years, that has provided a huge recurring revenue stream to many customers because, as you know, when a, a standard is upgraded, you have to throw everything else away. So that, that, that many companies are thrilled about that because the upgrade path are, are future revenue sources. But I do believe that if, if security, not only security, but in this particular case, a, standard, a more standardized, secure methodology for endpoint nope. and, and center location, if it were in existence today and well thought out, I think that would be helpful virtually to anyone who uses any of this kind of IoT uh, uh, gear in their, in their environments. So I would love to see some sort of a standardized um, uh, solution that, that Micron and, or Nanolock or others might posit that people could adopt that was very robust um, and there again lies cost, but if it could be done at a cost point that was straightforward and as Amit knows, when you integrate it in silicon, um, that can be done pretty effectively. And if you can do it in such a way that it's sophisticated, it will attack, for, it will attract hackers for sure. Because every time a standard is, is, is adopted, hackers, because it's published as a standard, hackers will want to go after it. But I would love to see some sort of an agent uh, center point uh, uh, standardization occur. That was great. Thank you, Greg. Um, so let me let me shift over because we got a couple of questions that popped up from uh, those who have been listening. Um, I'm not sure exactly who's uh, best to answer this, but we'll see uh, where, where they drop in. So uh, there was a question, maybe this is to you, Iran, of uh, a dependency um, uh, on uh, Micron hardware, uh, or whether the uh, Nanolock technology works with products from all memory vendors. So maybe you could quickly address that. Yeah, probably I didn't do a good enough job. So we work with all memory vendors. Um, to begin with, the market always requires from the memory vendors to have a second source. So we're not doing anything straight. And, and it was clear with Micron from day one that we are working with all the others. But by the way, there are other names that will join later, which are on a different kind of, uh, of memory. So number one, there's no dependency. We are working with Micron to have feature set and capabilities which can be unique for Micron, but all memory vendors for IoT, automotive, and industrial are working with now. That's answer number one. Answer number two is, um, or is there always a dependency on a hardware solution? And there are some customers that are coming to us and say, you have something which is not memory related. Can you protect the memory in software? And the answer is yes. We have an SDK that the customer can use in collaboration with his memory solutions that are made by the memory vendor. So the, there's zero dependency, and there's a full alignment also with the memory vendors that, number one, a customer can always have a second source, which is clear, and definitely an alignment and, and clarity with some memory partners that we have they have an advantage by intimate collaboration, and I, I dare to say that with Micron, it's it's pretty unique where um, we we found strong partners. That it's not only a business collaboration; it's an R&D collaboration, and 
we're bringing the solution to, um, I would say, new heights together. Right. Actually, uh, the way you actually addressed that sounded very uh, much aligned with what Greg had um, mentioned regarding the uh, standardization. Um, just to recall a data point that you had in your presentation, that you're already working with 80% of the memory vendors by uh, you know capacity or by by market output which means that you know you, you've become de facto uh, um, you know like a standard if you're already embedded with not only micron but um, you know, many of the other uh, key manufacturers uh, of memory um, so it, it's a good it sounds like a good position uh, to be in we were never in a meeting um, whether it's in around the world or in the US whether it's cameras or meters or even routers, that somebody said, this is our memory vendor, and we said, we don't work with them. Um, and if we, and, and of course, it could move from, and again, I don't want to go into the details of specific memories, but the market is changing and evolving and moving from something called NOR, N-O-R, to NAN, and we're moving there with the market and, and evolving concepts. We have a lot of work. Uh, again, I cannot expose everything, um, including with some some people that are on the call, but we are evolving in a fast pace, uh, looking at the market and 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 making sure that the customer will say this is not unique. So, well, this is unique, but it's not esoteric. It's not a single source. This is a multiple source, and this is a standard factor. Right. Um, actually, I have a, a question came up uh, regarding supply chain. Uh, um, we've, we've had a number of, um, uh, I guess, uh, conversations, certainly at the U.S. Congress level and, and other places where uh, supply chain has come up as an uh, area of risk. And, you know, from, uh, maybe this one uh, goes to Greg, but, you know, from a supply chain point of view, you're obviously, you know, a component integrator at uh, Nate Gear. Uh, as you mentioned, you're not actually... Um, uh, spinning uh, silicon uh, or ASICs or, or you know other core components, but you're either you're designing them and, and uh, sourcing them out to various uh, solution providers. Does that risk of the supply chain or you know the discussion of security in the supply chain does that uh, seem to lend itself to a solution like Nanolock? Is that you, do you see Nanolock as being able to provide some type of answer? Uh, to some of the supply chain risk uh, discussion? Uh, we do. In fact, I believe a standardized solution, a la Nanolock or, or of, the, of the same ilk that is supported by the Microns and others of the world, uh, would be a boon to offshore manufacturing, would be a boon to uh, supply chain management. We, as you say, don't spin our own silicon. We do offshore and onshore manufacturing. Uh, supply chain management is, is, is complicated by the security aspect of this. Uh, you know, just imagine, if you will, the story being true. Not sure if it is true. It may have been true, may not have been true. Some of you guys may know if it's really true or not. But the whole super micro problem where there was supposedly uh, a, a piece of silicon embedded in a circuit board that went undetected all the way through to a piece of code that gets embedded in an offshore manufacturing site and mists getting detected is a huge problem uh, for us to guard against. It may not be a huge problem that it doesn't happen every day, but if it happens once, it's a big problem. So we are taking steps at Netgear to ensure as best we can that our supply chain is secure. And there are certain steps along the way that should, could certainly be improved, sped up, uh, optimized, uh, et cetera, if a, uh, a, a nanolock type of solution, uh, if a micron kind of solution, if a Qualcomm kind of solution were became more commonplace, that is for sure. Great, great. I agree. I, uh, I've been racking my brain about the supply chain problem for probably a good decade. Uh, really didn't find any uh, uh, good good answers until recently. Uh, certainly uh, in discussions with Iran 
and, uh, and others at uh, Nanolock uh, seem to have at least uh, one part of that story. Um, I want to jump back to Iran. There was a question uh, that uh, was asked about your business model and more precisely uh, some of the sales and revenue uh, in the pipeline, uh, sales cycles, um, and, and maybe even a, a little bit simpler uh, question, or maybe a complex one, uh, the competitors. And, uh, you know, where, where are the competitors with regard to, um, you know, solving some similar problems? Okay. Um, these are a lot of good questions. Um, the business model is comprised, and again, you know, I'll get into too many details, so this is also uh, some kind of a trade secret together with our memory partners. But it based, and basically, the idea is not to pay for the embedded side, for the memory side, or for um, the SDK that we're providing, or the device side, but pay only for the feature set per active device. And, and we have taken measures with our memory partners to ensure that the customer can buy a secured memory at the same price of a regular memory, and still the memory partner can enjoy the upside. So this is the majority of the customers. There are some customers who are device makers who rather pay a lump sum and not a annual fee per active device, um, which is fine. And then again, um, we find the model for this device maker um, be that of the connectivity or the memory or the cameras or, or others. Um, but since most of our customers are enterprises, utilities, system integrators, they love the model of an annual fee and not pay upfront for the embedded solution. In terms of revenues, we shared it in the last presentation. We already have revenues. This is the first year of significant revenues and this is scaling. Uh, we are scaling alongside the adoption of the memory, and, and again, these are trade secrets of the memory partners of some of them are introducing with a lot of marketing power memory solutions to the market that we are enjoying and benefiting. Uh, the sales cycle is shorter than the sales cycle of a memory because we offer customers who want to do that to start with an SDK with a software solution and then at any time to move to the memory side. So if a deployment of a new memory in a device is about a year and a half, we definitely shorten that. Um, the cycle starts with an internal POC, um, then a pilot, a commercial pilot when our customers are bringing their customers and that to scale, and then it's a design in. Nanolock had done this in the last year and continue, will continue to do that in the beginning of next year, and we're predicting together with Micro and other partners the design wins to happen somewhere in Q2 2020, and, when you see the investment deck, you'll see that our scale is assuming and, and, and looking into a scale, significant scale, in the second part of 2020, which is in alignment with our partners. I hope that was comprehensive enough. Thanks, Iran. And uh, I also want to take the opportunity to thank Amit and Greg for joining us on uh, in this hour as well. Uh, the insights were uh, certainly fascinating. Um, I, I'll just add one final thought to that. I really, really enjoy working with Nanolock because of the power it has uh, and the power it's uh, leveraged to build ecosystems. Uh, ecosystems are critical in uh, any technology uh, area. And to be able to see the relationships uh, that Nanolock, that Iran and Nanolock team has uh, been able to form with companies like Micron in the memory space, uh, and with um, you know, solution providers such as uh, Netgear, um, all recognizing the uh, uh, opportunity that Nanolock is introducing um, you know, to help deal with the cybersecurity issues of these devices that are being attached to the internet. It's pretty exciting. So with that, I wanna thank everybody who uh, joined. Certainly remind you that there's uh, a lot more information about Nanolock on the R Crowd uh, investor website. Um, and uh, if you do have additional questions uh, after this call that uh, we didn't get to or weren't addressed, uh, please feel free to submit those and we'll get to them as quickly as we can. So thank you again uh, to our panelists and to all of those who uh, tuned in this past hour. Thank you very much. <laughs>